and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it to was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Cool TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Cross Talk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3. Coming up this afternoon, pressure builds on Rishi Sunak to return over £10 million from Tory party donor Frank Hester as it's announced police are investigating alleged racist comments made by him about Diane Abbott in 2019. Meanwhile, millions of women born in the 1950s could be in line for competition compensation after a watchdog finds the government failed to tell them about changes to the state pension age. And outraged fans demand Nike recalls England's official kit for Euro 2024 after it changed the St George's Cross from red to light blue and purple. Uh, now, uh, let's have a quick chat because I've just shown you something, uh, Alex. Uh, that I don't think you like very much. Uh, it, yeah. it is Iceland, that well-known supermarket to the stars. Uh, it's, it's not selling uh, hot cross buns. I'm not sure if you can get hot cross buns still there, but it doesn't look like it. They've changed them to tick buns. And uh, their head of products said, uh, it seems that some people don't like the traditional hot cross bun. They want a different design. Who are these people? Who are these people? I mean, I was effing and blinding in the green room before we came on air. I won't repeat what I said up there because it was pretty strong for a lunchtime on a Friday. Yeah. But my issue with all of this is this constant effort to erase Christianity as if in some way it is offensive to people. When it's not, it is the religion of this country. Look, you don't have to believe in God. You don't have to go to church. Believe in what you like. But it is the religion of this country. But more than this, it has been the fundamental underpinning to Western progress for 2,000 years. You don't have to believe in God to be able to look at, I don't know, all the countries with democracy and freedom and high levels of GDP and say, what do they have in common? If they don't have oil, what they've got in common is a well-functioning, modern society as a result of Judeo-Christian values. Now, you can erase that if you like. You can tear up all of the moralizing in the Bible. You can say it's all just a man with a big beard in the clouds that doesn't exist. Say, do, think, believe what you like. But don't you dare treat Christianity like it's something embarrassing or yeah, shameful or insulting. You, and that's what this is all ludicrous. about. It's, the, it's this ludicrous syndrome where shops, businesses, uh, corporations all seem to fear that there's something wrong and dangerous about Christianity and we have to celebrate all the other religions except for our own. Not to celebrate, there are certain uh, religions, I think, which are constantly being forced on us as if we must subscribe to them. Look, I lived in India for a long period of time, fascinated by Hinduism. I spent a lot of time reading the old Vedic texts, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, know a lot about Vedic philosophy, think it's brilliant. I never hear a thing about Hinduism. I've got a Hindu prime minister, but I don't see us all sort of getting around and yeah, joining yeah. in the spirit of Diwali yeah. and anyone pointing out, actually, it's not a religion with loads of gods, it's a monotheistic religion. No, you know, nick their yoga, nick their meditation, forget the rest of it. But there's just a certain obsession right now with, given what's going on in the Middle East, we all must, I don't know, start going to a mosque. Well, go to a mosque if you're a Muslim, go to a church if you're a Christian, go to a temple if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, a synagogue if you're a Jew. Just let people get on with their lives. Stop focusing all the positives on one religion and stop kicking Christianity. I, I just showed her this picture of the tick, Honestly, tick I bun. I knew it would set her off and I was right, wasn't I? Uh, but I do agree with you. We've got to stop demonising our own religions. By all means, celebrate the, uh, our, the other religions. Uh, but this is actually technically and uh, officially a Christian country. And, for example, let's, uh, let's go for hot cross buns. These are a celebration of Easter. And uh, when Christmas comes around, let all the these companies who sort of fail to say it's Christmas because they think it will offend other religions, just have some guts and don't be so ridiculous. Let's have some common sense. Let's uh, celebrate our own religion without demonising others. But at the moment, we're celebrating all other
other religions, but demonising <laughs> ours. It's absurd. I mean, another ridiculous story is what's going to be our top story. The fact that police are now investigating the alleged racist comments that Frank Hester made against Diana. But I think we all know those comments were disgusting and disgraceful. Not the sort of thing anybody should be saying about anybody else. He said he's sorry, so he admits to saying it. So what are the yeah. police investigating? Are they going to put him in prison for it? Well, what are they investigating? Why they are they wasting time? Crime, not hurty words. Oh, anyway, oh, we are asking matter. you, we want your opinion. Uh, in the light of this, that this Tory donor who's given, we think, £15 million altogether to the Tory party, one of the biggest donors in Tory history, uh, he did make racist comments about uh, Diane Abbott. Uh, that's been proved way back in 2019. So now that the police are officially investigating Frank Hester uh, for a crime, I would imagine a hate crime, Oh, I hate hate crimes. Uh, hate we hate are crimes. asking you, should Rishi Sunak now give back his £10 million donation? It's probably 15 actually, but 15. should he give back £10 million? We'll, we'll, we'll settle on 10 for now. Uh, let us know. Uh, give us a call on 0344 499 Text us if you like. Uh, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222. Or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Uh, but, uh, yes, back to that topic top story now and Tory donor Frank Hester is being investigated by West Yorkshire police for the allegedly racist remarks he made about former shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott. It's the latest blow for the Tories who have since been under pressure to return the 10 million quid given to the party by Hester following the scandal. While launching his local election campaign in Derbyshire today, the Prime Minister avoided answering when challenged on whether it was time to return the money. Well, obviously, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on police matters, but as I've said previously, what he said was wrong and racist, and he rightfully has apologised for it. There you go. Well, it comes amid dire electoral predictions for the Conservative Party as it continues to trail behind Labour in the polls, dropping to just four points ahead of reform. Meanwhile, channel crossings continue to rise sharply. Of course they do, with more than 500 migrants arriving on Wednesday, putting this year's total at 4,306 arrivals. Uh, joining us now is polling expert and politics professor Sir John Curtis. Uh, welcome to the show, Sir John. Always a pleasure to have you on board. I mean, in the light of uh, this new problem for the Tories, the uh, Frank Hester donation, uh, Frank now being uh, investigated by the police, that puts it into a different light. Plus, uh, Wednesday, a record number of migrants came across. One was stabbed, 510. Uh, and the total now stands at 10% higher than this time last year. So that isn't looking good. Uh, plus all the other problems. Uh, uh, he's launching today his local election campaign. <laughs> I mean, how are things faring for the Tories, do you think? Pretty bad, I would have thought. Yeah, the honest truth is, if you take the average of the opinion polls, and they've all of them been conducted... Uh, since the budget that was meant to try to restore the Conservatives' fortunes with that 2p cut in national insurance. The Conservatives are now running on average at 23%. That is even lower than the 25% to which they fell on the same calculation in the immediate wake of the downfall of Liz Truss. So if anything, the Conservatives have been going backwards so far this year rather than going forwards. And of course, the problem they face is indeed uh, they are in the local elections at the beginning of May. And basically, the whole of England and Wales has some kind of election or other to vote in, although it's a bit complicated as to who gets what where. Um, but the, his problem is that the most of the contests that are being fought over this year were last fought over three years ago in May 2021, which was the same day that Boris Johnson not only made about 200 uh, gains of seats uh, in the local elections, he won the Hartlepool by-election from Labour. The Conservatives were still were ahead of Labour in the opinion polls. So his problem is that because he's defending such a good baseline, Rishi Sunak is at risk of suffering quite substantial losses in the local elections. And I suspect, however, the one thing he will be hoping for is that perhaps reform will not be fighting these elections that widely. They're certainly not thought to be fighting uh, one of the sets of elections, which is for police and crime commissioners. We'll wait and see how many of the local council elections they fight. So that perhaps is the, the one silver lining for him. But basically, he's going into these local elections 
with the Conservatives in as weak a position as they, as they have ever been in this Parliament and defending a rather good set of results three years ago. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned about reform and fighting the local elections. It makes me cast my mind back to uh, 2013, I think it was, when UKIP came third in the local elections and really did, I think, put themselves on the map. I think you're probably right in suggesting that reform aren't going to be contesting them across the board in the same way. Uh, but where is reform support actually coming from? Because I'm tempted to say, with that four percentage points difference between the Conservatives and reform, according to the latest YouGov survey, um, that actually it only would require reform to go up 2% if they're taking all of their votes from the Conservative voters of 2019 to put the parties uh, at, an, uh, at, a, at a level. Um, but is that right? Am I misinterpreting things? Are reform actually also no, taking you're, you're, Labour you're, support? You're not far off, although um, I think what we should say is that YouGov, uh, as, and I'm not criticising them, but as a polling company, they have tended to have the Conservatives lower than many, though not all other pollsters, and to have reform somewhat on the higher side. If you take the average at the moment, the Conservatives at 23 are still nine points on average in the polls with reform uh, running a trial. But still, that, that's more than enough for the Conservatives uh, uh, to uh, worry about. And the truth is they are uh, predominantly coming from the Conservatives. Indeed, reform are now picking up rather more voters uh, from people who voted for the Conservatives in 2019 than our Labour. It's about one in five 2019 Conservative voters who are switching to reform now. Maybe a few of these would, if reform didn't exist, would have expressed their discontent with the Conservatives by voting for Labour. But for the most part, these are folk who, yes, they are concerned about immigration. They uh, believe in Brexit, although that's not all that concerns them. They, like those who are switching to Labour, they're also concerned about the health service. Um, they're also pretty concerned about the state of the economy. So the truth is, the discontent from which the Conservatives are suffering, which is essentially to do with the state of our economy and the state of our public services, that's something is also seemingly pushing people in the direction of reform as well as to Labour. That said, well, I think we might now be asking ourselves, did the government make a mistake last November and December in focusing in particular on the issue of immigration, which is certainly one of the things that particularly concerns uh, reform voters, um, because we know this is a very difficult uh, situation to deal with, but so far as asylum seekers are concerned, and simply latching on to the fact that the numbers were a bit lower last year was perhaps rather grasping at straws, and that in now focusing on the Miranda Bill and getting us all to talk about it, it's simply reminding us that, in fact, immigration to this country, despite what we were promised in the 2016 referendum and the 2019 election, is basically higher now than it was uh, four years ago. Uh, the Prime Minister now uh, doesn't like to talk about uh, the migrant crisis uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but he did mm -hmm. appear on the BBC a couple of days ago on the uh, news uh, uh, announcing that uh, 2024 will be the year of the bounce back and the economy has turned a corner. Uh, this is where uh, he is uh, resting his hopes and dreams, isn't it? The economy sure. and uh, a recovering financial situation not only for businesses but for people all over the country uh it, it, does he stand a chance on that uh, level sir john well i mean his hopes are not entirely without foundation um you know inflation is now lower uh, wages are now going up more uh, than our uh, prices at least uh, across the board um though economic growth is still pretty anemic um the problem how he faces is that even if people start to feel a little less bad off, and that's probably the way around to put it, given how much we've suffered in this parliament, not necessarily because of the fault of the government, but given how much we've suffered, it's probably a question of do we feel less badly off? But even if that is the case, the real question is, can the government claim the credit in the eyes of the electorate for the improvement that occurs? And the truth is, at the moment at least, all the opposition seems to have to do once we start a conversation and an argument between the parties about the economy is to simply remind voters what happened under Liz Truss and to argue at least that the reason why we are where we are is because of the uh, Liz Truss's fiscal event. And it's very, very difficult for the Conservatives to shake that off. The, the brutal truth is, is that no government in the post-war era that's presided over a market crisis of the kind that Liz Truss's fiscal budget um, uh, stimulated has managed to survive at the ballot boxes in the next election. So, I mean, Mr Sunak faces a poll lead that 
is uh, the Labour hub. It's no, no poll lead this close to an election has been has been of that size has ever been overturned. No government that uh, has presided over a market crisis has survived at the ballot box. Mr Sunak has to defeat the tide of history if he's going to remain prime minister at the next election. But maybe he'll be lucky and maybe he will. It seems to me that the Conservative Party have very little wriggle room and very few uh, places in which they can turn, given that, let's say, the party's sort of tropes and legacy legends are we are the party of low taxation, we are the party of a stable economy, we are the party of strong borders. These three things seem to be the big issues at the doorstep and they are all happening as a result of 15 years of Conservative incumbency. Yes. I mean, you know, of course, the reason why, um, uh, you know, taxation has been as high as it is, is because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the reason, again, why the health service is in the state as it is, is, again, uh, arguably the result primarily of the COVID pandemic, although there were signs of difficulty beforehand. You know, the, the government, you know, let's be fair to the government here. They have been dealt a difficult hand. Some of the migration is a consequence of the events in Ukraine, events in Hong Kong. Um, so it's not all uh, a result of simply Tory mismanagement. Um, but the problem uh, that they face is that uh, eventually the public are saying, well, there's enough, however, that you've got wrong. Uh, you've given us two prime ministers, one of whom ended up being somebody whose honesty was we, we could we we came to doubt another another one who seemingly couldn't run the economy effectively so whatever the misfortunes that the government has suffered and they are quite substantial in the end a difficult hand has been played rather badly and that for the electorate is perhaps the crucial bit uh, so john you are by some margin uh, the most esteemed and admired pollster in the country <laughs> and deservedly so so i'm going to put you on the spot uh, is there any chance at all that the Tories can win the election? And that is on the assumption that it's probably going to be late October, early November. Is there any way they can uh, turn this juggernaut around and win the election? And if so, how? Well, I've already said to you that, you know, they've got to defeat historical precedents now to be able to win the election. So you can see, I don't think it's terribly likely. What I will say to you is that the chances of the Conservative Party forming the next government are less than 5%, and st statisticians define less than 5% as something that is extremely unlikely. Um, so, uh, And that's not just simply because of the size of Labour's poll lead. It is also that even if the polls were to narrow and to narrow quite significantly, uh, the Conservatives don't have any friends inside the House of Commons. Apart from the DUP, nobody else is going to be willing to help them to run a minority administration. You put all that together and you can see why I think the probability of them being in office after the election is indeed now vanishing small. Yeah, and, and finally, Sir John, I mean, aside from a black swan moment, which could, you know, potentially destroy the Labour Party and turn the fate of the Conservative Party around, I think there's a sort of big disagreement happening inside CCHQ over whether yet another change of leader could do the trick and <laughs> save them from total annihilation. Where do you think the public are at in that? If they suddenly put some fresh and new at the front of the Conservative Party, might it see an upswing in support? Or would it just be a case that the public go, you can't do this again, you've already tried this three times in the last year? Well, it would have to be somebody extraordinarily charismatic, somebody able to provide a very uh, clear sense of direction for the government, and arguably one of the criticisms of Mr Sunak, he's not managed to do that, and to uh, suddenly persuade the public that there is a vision for the future of this country under the Conservatives is better than the one that's being offered by Labour. My problem is that when I think of the people we talk about as possible successors, Penny Mordaunt or Kemi Badenoch, for example, I think one has to say that at best, the belief that, the, that they have the qualities and capabilities required to achieve that remarkable turnaround are certainly not proven. And meanwhile, yes, the problem is, uh, do how do you really persuade the public? Well, actually, we gave you two prime ministers, three prime ministers, none of which we thought were any good. But could you please vote for the fourth one? That's going to be a very difficult argument. to <laughs> Bit of a long shot. Bit of a long <laughs> shot. Uh, so, John, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're now joined in the studio by political journalist and founder of the... Uh, what is this? Founder and director of mm. Simple Politics, Tatton Spiller. Uh, hi, thanks for coming along, Tatton. Uh, I would say that uh, the simple politics of this is the picture does not look good for the Tories, does it? I love uh, Professor Sir John Curtis's use of language. 
in that. I mean, he basically said it's never going to happen, but he said it with like percentages <laughs> and uh, like, a pot, uh, like a pollster. Less, and, yeah. less than five percent. Yeah. I mean, less than five percent. I mean, you might as well have said zero. <laughs> Yeah, but we, he said, we statisticians don't think that's very likely. Like, yes, of course. You've literally just said 5%. So, it's, I mean, they are in real trouble. Yeah, they are. They're in real serious trouble. We're talking about reform. And that is just the one YouGov poll. And there was the YouGov poll before that put reform as nearly as high as they were this time round. And the others have them a little bit lower and the Conservatives a little bit higher. Yeah. But whatever, I mean, if, if, if the Conservatives are polling 22%, like yeah. they are in, they it's it's possible they could be the third party. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I, look, I agree with you when it comes to certain polls. Uh, certain pollsters and people who commission polls use them as a sort of nudge effect sometimes. And I think there are people out there who want to see the Tories get a kicking in the hope the Tories will wake up out of their malaise and suddenly remember their Conservatives. But what we've seen, I think, over the past 10 years is this sort of straining against the two-party system. We've mm -hmm. got a factoring on the left anyway. We've always had the Lib Dems, the Greens, the yeah. SNP, Plaid Cymru, as well as Labour. The Conservatives have basically had a monopoly on the right, other than UKIP Brexit party reform, which is essentially one linear evolution. And we keep seeing in between elections that strain against people saying, I don't want the two party system. But then as soon as it gets to the ballot, they suddenly feel like they're straightjacketed and have to choose between the two legacy parties. Is it time we looked at that democratically and realised actually the two party system and first past the post is not fit for purpose? Well, it all comes down to first past the post. And the problem with breaking and changing the constitution and breaking the mold is that you have to want to do it and the two main parties don't, don't want to break it, it. Why don't why want to break it so you've got you know ed davy and nigel farage agree on very little <laughs> but when it comes to electoral well, reform they're all in because mm. their parties would massively benefit from it mm. and the greens and all all the smaller parties want proportional representation. They say that's for fair of democracy. And uh, the big parties say, nope, this system's very good. It Thank you very much. Us, yeah. We'll uh, stick with this. Yeah. And uh, what, do you think that this uh, breaking story today that uh, Frank Hester, the Tory donor, who uh, we're saying 10 million, but I think we were reporting 15 million. There's a sort of suspected yeah, I think he gave 10 million, million but it looks as if he gave five. Until the yeah, I think it's probably 15. Mm. But he's um, one of the biggest donors mm. to the Tories of mm. all time. And we know that he's mired in this alleged scandal of uh, alleged racist comments he made about uh, Diane Abbott. Uh, but the police have now come in, West Yorkshire Police, and say they're now investigating him for these alleged racist comments. Uh, do you think that will be a big factor in the uh, road to the election or just a, a sort of <laughs> another thorn in Rishi's side? I mean, he said he was. He, he said the horrid racist comments, and he said an MP think, yeah. should be shot. He wanted an MP yeah. to be shot. Yeah, I forget the exact words. Comments. Like, I think we were over that hump, right? Mm. Everyone knows it. Everyone now knows he said well, but, it. But yeah. the point is, from the Tories' point of view, they thought they were over the hump until today, yeah, when but, West yeah, Yorkshire. Yeah, they can ignore this. this. What's they it going to do? Because exactly. the public. It doesn't don't add any him. weight to what the public. The public know what this guy did. Yeah. The public know he's a wrong un. Yeah. Right. And the, the police are looking into it. When I first saw the story, I thought, oh, gosh, what else has he said? I presumed, because I got news flashes popping up on my phone, mm. that it was a new thing that had come mm. out and that maybe the Conservatives had known about it. Because that's the key. If they'd mm. known Saturn. what a terrible person he was and taken his money. That's different, but it's not. It's an investigation, okay, yeah. something we all no. know. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're in journalism, you realise you phone up the police and say, I want to report something to be investigated. Then you phone up a day later and say, are you investigating it? And the police have to say yes, because if you report something to the police, they have to then say, yes, yeah. we're looking Ooh, into it. That's a low oh, trick. Yeah. Well, no, but this, this, look, I've been in politics and journalism a long enough time to know that's exactly what happens. And I think this is more the Labour Party trying to kick them in the yeah. coffers. And because 15 the million quid is what they spent last time around in 2019 on the election. I think Labour think if they can yeah. keep the pressure on, and make the Tories cough up the money, that's the win there, yeah, not, yeah. not in terms of public opinion. Uh, that's the problem, is that Labour throughout the election campaign will be racist, 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 racist. Uh, no. Plus, uh, yeah, that's what they'll be saying. Oh, I that's, don't know, because they're, they're, trying be to, they're trying to win... To. They're, no, I think they'd be stupid to do it, because they're trying to win the Red Wall, and I think most of the people in the Red Wall are fed up with the sort of everything's There's racist There's a lot of constituencies game. that the race card will work very well in, and uh, well, they'll be playing it, trust I'm not me. So sure it's about, about that. finding that balance then, isn't it? How do you say one thing to one co cohort, another to yeah, another cohort, and exactly. lots of political parties have lost 
over history trying to mm. trying to do that. And especially now when so much is on national TV, you can do it on socials. Yeah. You can target socials yeah. to the north of yeah. England. And but you've, if yeah, you're going to write coherent messages, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, look, look, look at how Sakir Sam has jumped on defending the St George Cross from the Nike update. I mean, like, that tells you all you need to know about the Labour. Oh, wait a second, he's, a, he's clearly a patriot. Thank you, Sakir, for your service. Just like Emily Thornberry <laughs> was when she really welcomed yeah, all this. Yeah. What about Emily Thornberry? She hates the Essex. George Cross. <laughs> anyway, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. Uh, now police are investigating alleged racist comments made by Tory party donor Frank Hester about Diane Abbott. We were asking, should Rishi Sunak give back his £10 million donation. Minnie says, the police shouldn't even be involved with speech. It's a horrifying country we live in and people seem to just accept these draconian policies. Colin writes, he's only giving back what he took originally. And Charlie tweeted, of course he should. Well, that's sweet and short. Uh, Tom writes, uh, of course not. His comments are historical and tame compared to some of the stuff that Abbott herself has said, let alone the Labour donors who have expressed support for banned terror groups. Yeah, let's not forget. Yeah, let's there's not... also there's also a certain party leader who have been who's been accused of uh, once upon a time defending banned terror yeah. groups, and we'll be coming on to that a bit later because coming up after the break, former human rights lawyer Sakir Starmer has defended his decision to offer legal advice to an Al Qaeda spokesperson. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right yay, too. Quite yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry-on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missed it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, now, Sakia Starmer is always quick to reference his time as a human rights lawyer fighting for the little guy, a man with moral integrity. <laughs> but the Labour leader speaking on The Sun's new flagship show, Never Mind the Ballots, we're going to get that wrong one day, uh, refused to admit regret over some of his more questionable defences. Uh, let's have a watch. Al Fawaz, Al-Qaeda's spokesman in the UK, wanted in the US for helping to plot with bin Laden. Look, you you look, tried to stop him being extradited. You're giving different examples. The principle is exactly the same. No man. regrets. Lawyer gives legal you've advice. Never, it never looks... Never, it has hit the pillow one night. You've never thought, oh, I wish I hadn't done that one. But look, lawyers represent clients. Doctors um, treat patients. The, the fact a doctor p treats a patient doesn't mean the doctor agrees with what the patient's mm. beliefs are. Well, and we're still joined by political journalist and founder and director of Simple Politics, Tatton Spiller. Uh, I don't know if you watched the show last night. We should have told you to, actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you didn't, he talked... Uh, you can watch it on YouTube ..all now, sorts of policies. Uh, one of the things that uh, Harry Cole, the Sun uh, political editor, pressed him on was that, that old favourite, have you ever taken drugs? Yep. He, he refused... Is that to an, an admittance there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that wasn't asking you! <laughs> <laughs> Today? You very quickly said... <laughs> no, uh, that's a joke, folks. Um, seriously, uh, he refused to deny that he'd taken drugs seven times, but he did concede I had a good time at university. Why don't, they, why don't these people say, look, he's from a generation. If he said, look, when I was at university, I did a few lines of coke, I smoked a few spliffs, uh, that's normal. Uh, you know, why, why do they deny it? Let's just have a look at uh, uh, Keir in full denial or denial-ish mode. When did you last take illegal drugs? Oh, Harry, I had a good time when I was a student. What does a good time when you're a student look like? It means I had a good time when I was a student. But what does that mean? It means I had a good time when so I was a student. Some spliffs, doing some acid, partying, drugs. What, what was it? A good time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, so what did you make of that, Tat? Imagine... Well, I mean, the whole thing is ludicrous. But the thing that really jumps out of me is when you've workshopped a key line. So he, he decided in central office that I had a good That's time a, Yeah, they worked it out. It was a nice yeah, little yeah, yeah, nod yeah, yeah. to maybe yeah. I've taken some drugs, maybe I haven't, but not for yeah. a long time. But when you just have to repeat that line, it reminded me of when Lee Anderson that, that said something that, that the Conservative Party couldn't say was Islamophobic yeah. or not. Yeah. Right? They said it was wrong mm. and they wouldn't go further. And they all came out and said the same thing. Yeah. It was wrong. Why was it wrong? It was wrong, they would repeat. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah, what we've yeah, just yeah, seen yeah. Keir Starmer robotic. do here. Robotic, yeah. robotic repeating of a line that doesn't work. What does a good time mean? You can uh, have a good time at university I've got without a taking drugs. Yeah. I, know what, I know what he should yeah. have said. I had a good line when I was at university. How about uh, that? <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, you know, when I was at university, one of my subjects was philosophy, and there's a little core in the philosophy department who used to like sitting by the riverbank and having some outdoor seminars. And do you know what their mantra was? Study high. Do your revision high, take your exams high, get high marks. Yeah, there you go. It uh, sounds like it makes sense. Are. So that, that, that's that also, folks, is a joke. Uh, just say joke. no. Remember that. Joking. Remember that. Drugs are bad for you. Now, what isn't a joke actually is this sort of. I think one of the conservative poise against Sakir Sam is going to be looking at his time as a human rights lawyer and some of the people he's defended, both terrorist organised or now prescribed organisations and people with some pretty dodgy connections. I think fair to say when you're a human rights lawyer, it's not necessarily a moral assessment of one's character when you defend them it is a legal mechanism that everyone deserves some defense in law but to the average person out there who doesn't want to sort of regard the nuance it, it could potentially be quite harmful to Sakia Starmer if they suddenly come out of a roll call of all the ne'er-do-wells that he has been seen as part of his career to have been serving I think it really can. Um, I mean, they have this, this system uh, in, in law called the taxi rank system where a lawyer gets the next case up Right, you get, you're defending this person, you're the next one up, and off you go. You do not choose. Uh, now, when you're senior, like you did get, you mm. can choose a bit more. But as a junior lawyer, you take whoever, and you defend whoever it might be. Telling the public that's how it works is going to be a really hard thing for Keir Starmer to do. Well, he's also getting that narrative to across. That, that to those clients were yeah, exactly. and not picked. But, uh, but I think that what he was just saying about a doctor, I thought that was a really good line in the interview from last night, a doctor doesn't necessarily agree with the person who's 
surgery they've just performed. They've got them back on their feet, but they're not liable for anything they do once they're on those feet to go around. And everyone, every single human being is entitled to a legal defence. Mm. Yeah. By the way, uh, Starmer also uh, refused to uh, confirm that he would stick to the triple lock. Uh, so, uh, I mean, he said he hoped to, uh, but circumstances may change. So I don't think that was a particularly encouraging message for pensioners. And he also uh, kind of warned that taxes could well go up under his administration, which, given the level that they're at now, again, bad news for voters. I mean, I quite admire his honesty, but there are messages there uh, that won't do him too well, will there? I think, I, you see, what infuriates me about Sir Keir Starmer is that his lack of honesty, while you admire his honesty, I, I think that's great, I find that... He won't tell people what he wants to do. He won't tell people what he believes in. He said last night really clearly that he does not want, wants, he won't rule out, but he doesn't want tax rises for working people. Now, that's not saying no more tax rises. You just said he will see, to, we might well see taxes yeah, rise. Yeah. So it's, it's all of this hedge and fudge. And if you're 22 points ahead in the polls, surely you can stand up and say, this is us, this is Labour, this is what we will do... <laughs> you would think. It, over um, <laughs> our first 100 days. This, 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 and presumably that's going to come yeah. as the election well, campaign I know, starts. I, I almost feel like because they're so far ahead in the polls, they feel that they're exonerated from having yes. to do that because they're mm. just going to get it anyway. Not on a lighter note, it's not a proper political interview until you've asked the drugs question, until you've asked some other question that sort of delves into the person yeah. behind the power. And it seems to me that increasingly in politics, we run these uh, general elections more as presidential elections. And Keir Starmer's got a snatchy new pair of glasses he's put on there to try and make himself look a bit more sort of, I don't know, Clark Kentish. Um, but uh, he was quizzed by Harry Cole on his food preferences. Let's have a little listen, and I want to get your take on this. What is your favourite crisp flavour? Salt and vinegar. Always Very has good. been, always will be. Curry order. Well, I'm vegetarian. Right, but they do so. Chana know. masala, vegetable curry. Something do you like share that. your curry, or do you do you hoard it like Smithy? We share it. My wife's a vegetarian. My daughter's a vegetarian. Our son is not a vegetarian because when he was 10, we said, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Sounds good. So we, he'll have a lovely chicken curry alongside our vegetable curries. But, yeah, we share it. I like, the, I like the sound of Keir's son. Uh, no, no but, I was going to say... But let me know. tell you, let me tell you, he has lost my vote. I absolutely hate salt and vinegar, To Chris. me, this just, says, this just says salt and vinegar, very normcore, very boring, which we kind of know Sir Keir Starmer is. But I'm afraid if you want to throw some red meat to the red wall, you're going to have to go for the chicken vindaloo, right? Well, yeah, but not if he's a vegetarian. Well, no, I know. Should we just but... have a look at him backing up? Uh, you won't often see this. This is uh, Keir Starmer supporting Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner, of course, in trouble uh, amid allegations that she avoided capital gains tax uh, on a sale of a house of hers up north. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at him leaping to the defence of his uh, loyal deputy. Angela's explained herself. She's taken... Legal advice and tax advice. Are you going to publish that legal advice? Assured. Well, look, that's a matter um, for Angela. But look, of course I believe her. Um, but her neighbours say she's lying. They're on the record saying it's not true. But look, Angela's explained herself. She's taken legal advice and tax advice. Um, and they're absolutely clear there's no tax to play. Mike she Tatton. shouldn't be quite so unequivocal about that, if you ask me. Uh, what did you think about that? I mean, um, she, I, you said you said murky before we threw, at the rain before, of we threw yeah. before we threw to the clip. You said to me, "Here he is defending her." Yeah, and then I didn't hear him defend her once. That's, he that's said, point taken. "She's she says she's not done it." I believe her. she's investigated. I, right. I believe her. She. He didn't say the Labour Party have had an investigation. Yeah. He didn't say yeah, we've swung point. behind her. He just said she says she ain't done it. I believe her. So, and. Let's not forget, she is democratically elected. She's the one cabinet minister he can't fire. Mm. So he's, if he's not got probable cause, yes. he's got to say, she says it's happened, it's happened. Yeah, you're quite right. Yeah, arguably, he could have, he's laid the groundwork to throw her under the bus if it all goes yeah. uh, pear-shaped. Uh, but... Joss, can I just say, I think yeah. it might be unprecedented that in 2024, the two main parties are going to be led by two vegetarians. There you go. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. We're, we're winning. Don't we're know, winning. I'm, uh, I'm vegetarian. So, well, uh, oh my gosh, I'm surrounded. Anyway, by the way, I want to ask you. Actually, oh we haven't days. really got time, but you mustn't dislike people just because they're vegetarian. I can dislike people for all sorts you of arbitrary reasons. Yeah, you yeah. do. Okay, meat. <laughs> l- listen, listen. Meat is murder. Right. Uh, uh, let's talk about David Cameron. So, so, so yeah, yeah, there, 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 I don't know. There's no way to do this segue. Uh, by the way, if you enjoy meat, that's up to you. Uh, I don't hold any opinions about whether you want to eat meat or not. Uh, freedom of choice, that's what I'm for. Uh, David Cameron, uh, Lord Cameron of, uh, what do you call it? Sheeping Norton. Sheeping Norton. Norton. Oh, yeah, uh, funny he, Chinese he is, connections, that one. He's uh, the, now the Foreign Secretary, uh, hurtling around the world, making his own policies. He's now said that the UK, Britain, will withhold weapons with withhold weapons from Israel unless it lets aid into Gaza and sticks to international law. I mean, you know, I'd like to see some aid get to those poor Palestinians and all that. There is a humanitarian crisis going on there, but Cameron seems to forget here that uh, our policy is we stand with Israel. What does he think he's doing here? I think a lot of the public will be amazed that we're currently not withholding arms to Israel. The work, the things that Israel are doing... Well, they're an ally, aren't they? They are an ally, but and and we are not. Nobody is saying they shouldn't be able to defend themselves. Nobody is saying they shouldn't get those hostages back. But a lot of people are saying, you are mistreating a lot of people in Gaza, and there is a real crisis there. And um, everyone in the House of Commons has spoken about that crisis. And, And... asked Netanyahu, asked the Israeli, the Israeli government to, for want of a, this is not the best term, but go easy a little bit, right? The idea that we've been doing that, they've been ignoring us, yeah. and we've still been giving them weapons, will come as a surprise to large parts yeah. of the public. I think what I think is quite remarkable is I don't think I've ever heard a foreign secretary before actually sort of tell the world who we sell weapons to. You know, it usually takes an investigative journalist to follow the money and dig around those sorts of geopolitical yeah. connections. And I think that's a bit of a clangor. But I think it's also important to point out that a spokesman for the Israeli government basically said, we don't care. We'll get our weapons from somewhere else. The British mandate in Israel ended in 1948. So I do question whether a sh- uh, Lord of Xi Ping Norton really had I think his, you'll uh, find, I think you'll find that Israel, Israel are always a good customer when it comes to uh, weapons. But I agree with you. It, it, I don't, know, many many what, I don't know what the hell he thinks he's doing. He's giving us policies from the North London dinner party circuit, sig- uh, virtue signalling. We are supposed to be allies of uh, Israel. But I, this is what I think, for what it's worth, uh, we have, if we want this uh, horror to end, we have to let Netanyahu get to a position where he thinks he can stand up and say, I have now destroyed Hamas and the the hostages have been released. If we don't get there, this will carry on. So just saying Uh, we're not going to sell you weapons is not going to have any effect at all. Getting them to that point is going to be very expensive in terms of He'll be willing to make compromises, though. He'll be willing to be pragmatic about it. You've just got to allow him to save face. It's such a complex picture in that particular region. You've got to ask yourself what the Egyptians want, what the UAE want, what Qatar wants, what Saudi wants, because there's many people all with sort of skin in the game when it comes to what's going on right now in Gaza. And I think whatever Britain says or does uh, is probably not going to move the needle a lot. Doesn't matter very much, no. Anyway, we have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime. Police are investigating the alleged racist comments made by Tory party donor Frank Hester about Diane Abbott. So we're asking, should Rishi Sunak now give back his £10 million donation? John writes, Diane Abbott was suspended from the party it's for true. doing the same thing. It's true. Gregory says, I think all parties are addicted to donations. The yes. larger the donation, the larger the influence. We should cap the donation ceiling to any political party it's 100 quid. Yeah, then Blimey. political parties would cease to exist then. There's your <laughs> yeah, problem. Uh, Mike has tweeted, so the police won't investigate a house burglary anymore, but will investigate nasty words. Exactly. And Don jokes, give the money to me <laughs> so I can fix the potholes yes, in our roads. That is the yes, text Dom. of the day. Here's to you, Don. Absolutely right. Now, coming up after the break, millions of women born in the 1950s could be in line for up to £10,000 each after a watchdog has found the government failed to tell them about changes to state pension age. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart screen.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was move on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, thousands of so called WASPy women are demanding they receive compensation after the government failed to communicate state pension changes around the age of retirement. 3.8 million women were not made aware of the age change and were forced to delay retirement without adequate warning or were simply plunged into poverty. Uh, and we are still joined by founder of Simple Politics, uh, Tatton uh, Spiller. I mean, th this is an injustice. I mean, this was uh, 95, wasn't it, when uh, the then Labour government uh, scrapped the 60-year-old pension uh, threshold for women. Uh, it used to be 60 for women, 65 for men. Very sexist. Uh, so they lost that. But uh, apparently, three point uh, was it 3.8 women just weren't told, and they'd all budgeted, of you course. know, for for getting their pension and all that. I was reading about one lady because of this. She she uh, had to sell her house, so it plunged a lot of these women into uh, financial chaos. I think that when we've got. Um... That uncertainty retire. Listen, my, my parents in law are retiring right now. They're just going through that process of telling telling their bosses. And it has been years of financial calculation, Planning. working yes, out what they yes, can do yes, and really yes. and to have that pulled out from under yes, you. So and you right. also said how long ago it happened. And that's where we're at with scandals. Mm. The post office scandal, which we've all been made aware of all of a sudden. Mm. Um, and and then the infected blood scandal and all these things have been decades in the making and the people who have lost out, lots of them have died without, without that help. And it, it's also 
landed on Rishi Sunak's feet. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He's got. To, he's the one who's been caught out by the ombudsman. He's the one that's been caught out by ITV drama. He's the one. So even though they've got nothing to do with this government, mm -hmm. yeah, these I mean, scandals John, are John all Major, there. I think who brought this legislation in back John, in 1995. Yeah, it was John Major. John, was sorry, my yeah. fault. But my you know, fault. we don't John Major. Labour as well as everybody else. I think the difficulty. Tories again. The big difficulty <laughs> now, when you've got these sort of historic cases, I'm not mm. saying that the the rights mustn't be wrong. To me as a woman, I think especially so. But it puts me in mind of what's just gone on in Birmingham City Council, where they have had to spend millions mm. on equal pay settlements. As a result, they've basically gone bankrupt and everybody's mm. council tax is going at 21% right in the middle of a cost of living crisis. It's a pretty Very good point timing. about that, Tat, and people spend years planning for mm. their retirement uh, based on the pensions that they're going to get. If you suddenly don't get them, for another five years. Five Absolute years. carnage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, let's move on to the big story of the day, the St George's Cross on the England kit. I mean, the fans are in uproar about this. Our, uh, Nike, the American company that decided to do this, called it a playful update on the St George's Cross. That's England's flag. This is going to be on England's kit uh, for the Euros in the summer. There it is, sort of blue and pink and orange and gold. Well, it's not the St George's so flag. It's is like it? uh, this is what annoys me about this. Who asked for a playful update? Why can't we have the traditional flag? And uh, if uh, Nike love playfully updating people's flags, why don't they have the guts to update their own flag playfully? Have a mess around with the stars and stripes. Haven't got the courage to do that, have you? Why didn't they just? leave well alone. But we didn't need another kit. It is ripping off fans. We now, every time there's a tournament, they've got to get out another shirt. Not just one shirt, another away shirt, another training shirt. This shirt goes on sale, I think we're playing tonight, or tomorrow, we're playing tomorrow we're night. Brazil, seven. yeah. Um, this shirt goes on sale for that, £120. Oh, is that how much it is? And oh. the children's one is £10 less. That's, no! That's so, so... That's why we have these all, all these shirts because so every two money, years yeah, yeah. they can then flog them out again. Why aren't we? We could still be using the one we used ten years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone could afford it. And then what happens is Nike have to go into some kind of creative hub and sit around and throw balls at each other. Whatever goes on in these things <laughs> and and go well. Let's get creative with the flag. Yeah. And no one says there's no such thing as a bad idea in this place. So everyone goes, oh okay. Yeah, Should well, we do the rainbow colours for not, LGBT? No, no, that's too far. Almost, almost. Let, I mean, this, I, let me tell you something, let me tell you something. The Nike tick, I'm giving Nike, the big American company, fair warning. We're going to playfully update your tick next week. See how you like it. Uh, now, uh, both, uh, such a serious issue is this, that both... Uh, the leader of Her Majesty's opposition and the Prime Minister have spoken. Uh, which one should we do first? Should we do... Uh, Sushi. Starmer. Oh, Starmer Lego first. Um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unified... It doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. All right. I'm not even sure they can properly explain, explain why they thought they needed to change in the first place. Now over to you, Rishi. Obviously, I prefer the original, and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. There's no point actually having a national flag if you're going to change its colour and its design. It's therefore not the national flag. <laughs> the whole point of having the national identifying flag is you look at it and go, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's England. That's what that and flag And by the way, represents. by the way, the justification, Just the, 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 the uh, mealy mouth justification for this is actually it reflects the training kit that the 1966 uh, World Cup winning to England team trained in. And that, that isn't even true if you look at the kit. So, uh, we'll, can we have our flag back? We need to move on, Tatton. Oh. We need to move on. Oh, Sorry. You've, you've missed out. No, Go you've on, missed then. out. Go on, then. Go on. Oh, wait. Wait. Well, it's a terrible glib line now. Go on. Uh, it was just at their mood board. They yeah. got... They printed up photos or looked at the mood board and somewhere on that mood board was an England's training kit from 66. Yeah. So that's how the mistake happens because they didn't care about details. Uh, they just uh, wanted uh, to be... They playfully updated it. That's what they playful. said. Playful. Uh, it wanted to be playful. Yeah, we're playfully updating right, no. your tick uh, and you won't like it. Also talking about Garrett playful Club. updates, apparently uh, the ex-defence secretary has spoken out after heads of the civil service and the Emma and people in the MI6 have resigned their membership of London's Garrick Club because basically you have to be a man to 
to be a member. Now, I don't understand what is so wrong about this. Lots of women are banging their fists on the table saying we want female only spaces. If men want to get rid of the old ball and chain and go out for a whiskey with their bloke chums, <laughs> let them. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Patton, what do you think? Uh, I think if we look at historical power, uh, historical power where there's been a lot of all male spaces has created exclusion. I think that we're all people. I don't like, I just want people yeah, to hang it, out. But it's, like, but it's peace and love. It's a free country. It's a free, yeah, sure. It was yeah. a free country. It's a free country. And uh, this is an all. Uh, women are allowed in the Garrett Club. They just can't become members. And by the way, all over London, probably other cities as well, there are women only private members clubs as well. So if you want to go to these places, yeah. why can't you? If men want to continue the patriarchy by hanging out together and excluding women, they don't need a private members club to do it. They can just go anywhere by themselves. Yeah, can't and they? we do. Uh, now, uh, okay, talking cheers. of women, Stormy, see what I did? The Stormy Daniels, uh, the porn star who allegedly had sex with Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump is about to go to court because of this hush money trial. It, it, it is alleged that uh, when uh, uh, Donald Trump, or that he gave her money not mm -hmm. to talk about their mm -hmm. liaison. And uh, Stormy Daniels uh, is saying she really hopes she's going to be called as a witness because she wants to get face to face with the Donald. I think we've got a little uh, bit of uh, Stormy talking, have we? Two. Let's go. I'm absolutely ready. I've been ready. I'm hoping with all of my heart that they call me because, as I showed on the stand against Michael Avenatti, no one, I don't need someone to speak for me. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I relish the day that I get to face him and, and speak my truth. Will you relish that, Tan? That moment? Uh, I, think I will, I I will, will. not be setting the video recorder <laughs> for that trial. <laughs> um, I'm, I think I will. It'd be great fun. I, listen, I mean, she. It, there, there is restorative justice where you meet your abuser, but there's not much evidence that he abused her. Yeah. That's <laughs> the, but that's not. That's not the. the it's about this financial transaction. So yeah. it's a little bit different to that. It's an intriguing Tatten. prospect. Tatten Spiller, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Very entertaining thank hour. Now, thank you. Coming up after the break, another blow for the Tories as an investigation into Tory donor Frank Hester is launched following his allegedly racist remarks about Diane Abbott. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Top Talk TV on Top TV, TV. On, TV on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, absolutely. It was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Now, coming up in this hour, pressure builds on Rishi Sunak to return over £10 million from Tory party donor Frank Hester after it is announced police are investigating alleged racist comments made by him about Diane Abbott in 2019. Meanwhile, millions of women born in the 1950s could be in line for compensation after a watchdog finds the government failed to tell them about changes to the state pension age. And outraged fans demand that Nike recalls England's official kit for Euro 2024 after it changed the St George's Cross from red to light blue and purple. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. West Yorkshire police say they are investigating the alleged racist comments made by a Conservative Party donor about Diane Abbott. The suspected remarks were made by businessman Frank Hester in 2019, saying that the former Labour MP should be shot. Mr Hester has apologised, but insisted they had nothing to do with her gender nor colour of skin. A man who murdered a couple with the opioid fentanyl has been jailed for life. Luke DeWitt, who worked for Stephen and Carol Baxter, poisoned them with the painkiller and rewrote their will to leave their business to him. DeWitt will serve at least 37 years behind bars. The US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is in Israel calling for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza. It follows a joint statement from Britain and Australia, warning of the potentially devastating consequences of a ground offensive in southern Gaza. Foreign editor of Jewish News UK, Yotam Confino, told Talk TV the calls for a ceasefire are unlikely to amount to anything. It is a sign that the United States is also growing tired of this situation and that it's now trying single-handedly to to, um, to enforce a ceasefire. But we have to remember that even if the United States Security Council uh, votes and agrees on, agrees on this resolution, it doesn't mean that Hamas and Israel will abide by it. It comes after the UN Security Council voted against the US calls for a ceasefire. China and Russia both vetoed the resolution put forward by the US with the Russian envoys describing it as an empty rhetoric. Retail sales remained flat in February, with food and fuel declining partly down to poor weather. Official figures show sales growth was 0% last month, down from a growth of 3.6% the month before. The Prime Minister has weighed in on a row over Nike's New England shirt, which features the Cross of St George in blues and purples. Rishi Sunak has said our national flags should not be messed with and Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer is even calling for the brand to recall the official Euro kit. Nike says it's a playful update of the Cross of St George and it has no plans to recall it. And Chester Zoo says it's hopeful two new snow leopards will go on to have cubs. It's the first time in the zoo's 93-year history that its carnivore experts have ever cared for the highly threatened big cats. The pair has moved into a brand new home that's been purposefully built using more than 600 tonnes of rocks to recreate the rocky terrain of the Himalayan mountains. Chester Zoo's curator of mammals, Mark Brayshaw, told Talk TV the conservation is worth the effort. Well, snow leopards are 
vulnerable to extinction. There's only, despite having this huge range across uh, Himalayas and Central Asia, there's only estimated to be about three and a half thousand mature individuals. So you can imagine that they're very diverse, uh, sorry, very dispersed. Mm. To such an extent, they're actually, they've earned the moniker, the ghost of the mountains, because they're rarely spotted. So very rare. Those are the headlines now. Here's Joe Wheeler with the weather. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. You could be forgiven for thinking that spring has arrived. We've seen temperatures up to 18 degrees Celsius in the last week, but it's all changed this weekend as that area of cloud and rain crossing southern parts brings much colder air from the north. Now, that cold air is already over Scotland. Sunshine and showers there, but those showers arriving on gale force winds, so it's going to feel pretty perishing with temperatures in fairly low single figures. Meanwhile, the southeast will brighten up, perhaps just before nightfall, uh, but certainly clearer skies are overnight. So those showers just keep coming from the northwest, some of them heavy, thundery, uh, could be some hail mixed in and turning wintry over the higher ground as well. Temperatures overnight, low enough for a touch of frost, but most places will escape frost free on account of there being too much breeze. And indeed, that wind will pick up even more through the course of Saturday. And so we're looking at a significant wind chill for many parts of the country, but perhaps most noticeable in the south. So for everybody, sunshine and showers, the winteriness extending down into the Pennine, over the higher ground of Wales and temperatures in the south probably reaching around 8 or 9 degrees Celsius but feeling more like 4 or 5 in the wind chill. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Uh, welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, and we're going to talk about this just now. We didn't quite have time, but Got let's, let's, let's talk topics. about it right now. Uh, well, by one of those remarkable turns of events, Channel 4 has been investigating itself to find out if anyone there at that channel actually knew about what Russell Brand was allegedly up to when he worked there in terms of the alleged sexual assaults he's accused of. And guess what? This channel for oh, investigation. Man, no one knew. It's fa they have found out that no one no at knew. Channel 4 no. knew. Just fancy yeah. that. I mean, no one at ITV knew about Philip Schofield, except even somehow I knew. Uh, no mm. one at Channel 4 knew that <laughs> Russell Brand was some sort of cad occur and a licentious, lascivious, horrible creature. Allegedly, except somehow, allegedly. Except, some, except somehow I somehow knew just by watching him on television. You know, this is what really gets me about people in this industry. Everyone goes, oh, I didn't know anything. It's like even people sitting at home with eyeballs can see what's going on here. Yeah. You know, Jimmy Savile in his creepy shell suits and all his gold jewellery touching up kids. No, BBC <laughs> didn't know. We all knew. I mean, it just it beggars belief. Every single time there's zero accountability yeah. because what happens actually a lot in the showbiz world, and let's actually tell it as it is, what happens is someone comes along who, you know, the producers and the exec editors think they've got a massive personal following, and all of a sudden, the blinkers go on. That person can do no wrong. Ooh, don't upset the talent. They must be held up to a different set of standards as if they're demigods. This is the big problem in the world of entertainment, probably in sports as well. Some people suddenly find themselves completely exempt from the same sorts of laws and moral codes that govern the rest of us. I'll tell you what's interesting is, uh, to be fair to Channel 4, uh, Russell Brand, and by the way, we must stress that Russell Brand uh, denies any wrongdoing, he denies all the allegations against him, but he is being investigated, or he's been twice interviewed by the police about a number of uh, alleged incidents. Uh, but uh, to be fair to Channel 4, they uh, they did uh, sort of expose his alleged behaviour in their own programme, Dis Dispatches, uh, which uh, sort of worked in conjunction with the Sunday Times. Uh, but, uh, you know, Russell Brand is, you know, th these companies, you know, as you said about Philip Schofield, uh, everybody knew what he was up to. And the ITV said, nobody here well, had any idea. Somehow, well, how come you and I knew? got to me. I've yeah. never even worked there. I knew. Alex knew. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Mrs. when... Mrs Miggins knew. So these companies, oh, we've investigated ourselves. 
and it turns out that we're completely innocent. Oh. Yeah, OK, then. No. Right, let's see. Anyway, uh, on, the subject on to of you. investigating, the police are now investigating, because, you know, why not? Alleged racist comments made by Tory party donor Frank Heston about Diana Abbott. Yes, it's a waste of police time. We all know that. The man's admitted to saying it and said sorry. But, you know, we have way too many police not up to enough at the moment. Uh, so we're asking, should Rishi Sunak now give back his £10 million donation? Throw in your two-bit on this Friday, why don't you? Pick up the blower, type in the following digits, 03444991000. You even get to speak to Kev. Text us 8732. Put talk in front of your message if you'd rather use that method. Or you can tweet us on x at talk TV. I always like the way you extemporise on that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's very good. Very florid. And we have more of your texts actually coming in on this. Uh, here we go. Neil says, it's staggering that the police are now investigating this matter. Is this what we've come to? Yes. Uh, yeah, I tend it to is. agree. I mean, is, what he did is horrible and wrong. It's what he said was definitely... Matter. What are they what? Did he say he's already said he said it? Case closed. So, so why are we investigating hurty oh. words? Hurty words. What are we, like five years old? Uh, Helen writes, Diane Abbott said the prejudice experienced by Jewish people was similar to, but not the same as racism. She apologised. Frank Hester has apologised. What's the difference? Very good point. Seamus says, if the full comment is considered rather than picking out a few words, it's clear that there was no racist remark. And Phil tweeted, it depends on how strongly they want to condemn the remarks. I personally don't care. And that wasn't me saying that. That was in the, uh, the text there. But also, I personally don't care. I don't really either. <laughs> but, no. uh, you know... <laughs> say what you like. I mean, sticks and stones yeah, don't, and all Don't that. let people Brother, tell you what you can resilient. and cannot say. All these politicians, they're going to spend all their time telling you what you can and cannot say, going, language is so important. No, 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 you say what you like. It's tedious. Anyway, we're going to talk about it, though, because on to that top story. Tory donor Frank Hester is being investigated by West Yorkshire Police for the allegedly racist remarks he made about former Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott. As former Shadow Home Secretary, she knows what the police should be getting up to. It's the latest blow for the Tories, who have since been under pressure to return the £15 million, speculated £15 million, given to the party by Hester following the scandal. While launching his local election campaign in Derbyshire today, the Prime Minister avoided answering when challenged on whether it was time to return the money. Well, obviously, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on police matters, but as I've said previously, what he said was wrong and racist, and he rightfully has apologised for it. God, do they like hiding behind things? Oh, well, the police are not can't comment. In front of oh, we can't time. comment while the it wasn't machinery was he in front of a bus. Yeah, of course, the, heavy the... machinery. Yeah. Yes, uh, it comes. All this comes amid dire electoral predictions for the Conservative Party as it continues to trail behind Labour in the polls, dropping to just four points ahead of reform. Meanwhile, channel crossings continue to rise sharply, with more than 500 migrants arriving on Wednesday, putting this year's total to more than 4,000 arrivals. Joining us now is uh, Dr Alan Mendoza, Executive Director of National Security Think Tank, the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, always a pleasure, Alan, of course. Uh, thank you for joining us. We've also uh, got the sun and we've got, uh, we've got Trevor uh, Cavanaugh. Oh, my God, my, my cut run of over. We've got you as well, Titans Trevor. I didn't realise Trevor was on Thank board. You. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Double whammy. Well, uh, let's go to you first, Alan. Uh, a terrible day for Sunak on Wednesday. Not only uh, mm -hmm. did 514 migrants come over on 10 different boats, uh, that took the total to just over 4,000, which is 10% higher than the same number this time last year. Uh, also, one of the migrants, uh, while being escorted by our friendly border force vessels into Dover Harbour, was stabbed. Uh, so, altogether, not a great day for Mr Sunak and his pledge to stop the boats. He doesn't talk about it anymore, does he? Because not only has he not stopped them, the situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Well, yes, it's a, look, it's a huge problem. You're, you're a hostage to fortune the minute you come out with a slogan around, say, stop the boats, that isn't really in your control, because stopping the boats would mean stopping them in France, as opposed to anywhere else, unless you were prepared to uh, use naval forces to interdict them, which uh, we're not. So as a result, the slogan was always a bit of a hostage to fortune. And the problem you face is that uh, although last year's figures were better, than the year before. There are factors out of our control in terms of the supply side and the ability of these criminal gangs to get people over here that means there, there are going to be problems with the total. And yes, uh, that number increasing is an issue and it's going to increase pressure, isn't it, around the whole, uh, what are we doing about illegal 
uh, migration into the country um, and where are we at with the Rwanda bill, which has, of course, now got mired in the so-called ping pong with the Lord. So it, it is something that needs to be unpicked very quickly uh, in April uh, in order to move this whole debate forward and to show that some action has been taken to try and stem the flow. Now, I'm, I'm glad you talked about the fact that we're not using naval forces. And it's interesting, actually, that Rishi Sunak is convening European leaders at Blenheim Palace to discuss this, even going as far as calling it a migration emergency. My understanding is if you declare something that's a national emergency, you can cite Article 33 of the UN Convention and you can happily say we're going to turn around our borders, uh, protect our borders by turning boats around in the Channel. Italy proposed doing this. The reason they couldn't was because the EU turned around, Ursula von der Leyen flew down, met George Maloney and said, Oh, you do that, we're going to stop uh, paying off your debts. And so uh, Maloney had to backtrack. But Trevor, do you think it's about time at this Blenheim Palace meeting that European leaders actually realise the level of the threat, if we have got so far as calling it an emergency, that they actually gift themselves some emergency powers, bite the bullet, and someone puts their head above the parapet and stops the boat, actually physically stops the boat, because that is the only way to break the model? Well, I don't think that the European Union has any great interest in stopping the boats. I think that we're no longer in the European Union. Uh, as far as they're concerned, it's a price we have to pay for being outside. And they're probably encouraging in their own way the movement of the people towards the coast where they basically get, get on board a boat as if they were paying passages, which, of course, they are. And the idea that we can't stop them in mid-channel because there's the risk of life and limb applies surely as much to the French side of this equation as it does to the British Navy and the lifeboat uh, institution. Um, these people should not be coming across the channel as they are at the moment in the numbers that they are doing and with nothing to stop them as far as we can see. The French are being paid a great deal of money by British taxpayers to do something about this. And the fact is that the numbers, as you say, are exponentially rising, not falling. Uh, I mean, Sunak, you know, frankly, Trevor, he's just not very good, is he? I mean, I'll stop the boats. He's not stopping the boats. Uh, you know, he, he, he's uh, in a real mess over this Tory donor. Uh, do you think uh, that he should return this £10 million? Uh, or do you think uh, that maybe, uh, probably like me and Alex, the electorate aren't that bothered about this, you know, oh, this racist man who said racist things about Diane Abbott, who herself is suspended from the Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party for racism. Uh, uh, this is a Westminster bubble issue, is it not? I don't think it will be uh, a major factor in the run-up to the election. What's your view? Well, my view is that the police have given up policing real crime and are now doing, uh, concentrating all their attention and their resources on so-called hate crime. The hatred here is mainly directed at Hester because he's a Tory and a Tory supporter and a Tory donor. Uh, that's the key to this, not anything to do with what he said, which was obviously unacceptable. But um, uh, Diane Abbott is a very controversial figure. And I'm not in any way suggesting that the sort of language that Hester used was acceptable. But it is, as you said earlier, it's sticks and stones. Nobody is getting hurt in this. I know she is claiming all sorts of uh, consequences from this um, remark, which was several years ago, and for which an apology has been made. And she's been forgiven for her apology on the, on the basis that uh, Jewish people are not subject to racism, and her apology was accepted. Why can't this be? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They both apologised. Well, yeah. uh, what's the difference? Yeah. yeah, I don't remember anybody actually stepping in the, the defence of Brexiteers when we were getting spat on and having our hair pulled out. But never mind, I lived through it. Um, Alan, I want to go back to you and I want to take you back to talking about the migrant crisis, the emergency as it's now being called, because you're in a position to perhaps shine a bit of a light on how much of a security threat this all poses. I bring up regularly on this show that, of course, porous borders in themselves is a huge threat to national security, but also that these... Uh, traffickers are connected to, at the very least, international criminal cartels, at the very worst, hostile regimes and terrorists. Do you have any sort of uh, assessment of how much of an actual danger the boats crossing the Channel pose to UK national security? Well, it really comes down to this, Alex. If you don't know who's coming into this country until they arrive, basically, through an illegal 
uh, method of some kind. And then they present, you know, potentially false papers uh, and then might even slip away while you're trying to, you know, take time to understand who they are. You're inherently creating a national security risk. That's why, um, you know, sort of uh, the increasing numbers of illegal migrants here are a problem in terms of security implications. You just don't know who they are. So the reality is, yes, we know the gangs are connected criminally. We know there have been some attempts or some talk about um, hostile states like Russia being able to slip people through. We know there have been the potential for Islamist extremists to come in uh, on, on those uh, boats as well. And the reality is that's why the government is going to need to get a grip on it. And in fact, why any government is going to need to get a grip on it. If you don't know who's coming through your front door, you stand to uh, have a security risk to your population. And that is why we've got to get action on this as quickly as possible. And again, the Rwanda scheme, you know, which again is mired in that sort of uh, you know, kind of problem right now, you know, is something towards uh, you know trying to close the door and trying to persuade people not to come here. But that won't necessarily help stem any security risk because if someone's coming here for nefarious purposes, they're going to try and get in, come what may. Uh, Trevor, uh, this uh, alt-EU conference that they're calling it up at Blenheim Palace where Rishi has called all the European leaders for a conflab about the migrant crisis. Uh, you know, I uh, don't consider myself to be a genius, but I'm telling you right now it will achieve the square root of damn all. Uh, why doesn't he realise that we've left the EU? Uh, why doesn't Keir Starmer realise uh, that the solution uh, to the migrant crisis is not to ask France to start cooperating because they never will? Uh, why on earth did Rishi Sunak, why is he sticking to this ridiculous smoking ban thing where you can only smoke if you were born uh, before 2009? Uh, what, what kind of politics is all of this? You know, people voted to leave Europe. He's saying, I'm going to have a conference of all the European leaders. Uh, the smoking ban won't make any difference at all. It's profoundly unconservative. It's com com profoundly un-libertarian, uh, freedom of choice. Uh, and he's got his high taxes as well. I mean, he's going into this election as, uh, you know, saying I'm the Tory prime minister. But he's not a Tory, is he? Or he certainly has not uh, practised Tory policies. Well, I think the Blenheim conference is what you might call displacement theory. <laughs> so you're trying to distract attention by pretending to do something away from the fact that you're doing nothing. Uh, the fact that those numbers have increased rather than decreased tells you everything you need to know. And Alan was absolutely right that a large number of the people who are coming in, many of whom, indeed all of whom, we have no idea about until they land and have been questioned. The security services know very well that a significant proportion of those are real risks to our security. And indeed, in some cases, they are being sent here to carry out the wishes and desires of people who are hostile to our security. Those things are on the record and have been stated in public. So I think that um, the big problem is that there are two forms of immigration here. One is the legal, which is completely out of control and unacceptable, at the rate that's coming in uh, with visas approved by this government. And the other is the highly visible face of illegal uh, immigration, which is a serious threat to our long-term security. I don't think that we fully appreciate just how serious this is. Um, Islamism is a rising scourge across Europe. And I think that there is a feeling by places like Russia that we need to be taught a lesson and they are facilitating in some cases um, from reports that we've heard from security experts, the passage of these people across who are uh, against the national interest and the safety of this country. Yeah, I mean, picking up on that, Alan, we saw the scenes, didn't we, when uh, Russia was essentially bussing migrants to the borders of Belarus and Poland to rattle the fences and try and create skirmishes along the border. Uh, they've tried to do the same to Finland, who have now closed their borders entirely. You're seeing flights leaving Istanbul on a daily basis, fully booked of migrants being flown over to Nicaragua to storm the American borders. This is essentially an act of grey zone warfare. Yes, the Russians have shown uh, over the last uh, few months that they are capable of trying to weaponize the uh, migration issue in order to further their own goals. They would love to destabilize 
uh, Europe uh, as, as much as they can, including ourselves, of course, in that, uh, by trying to make this a big touchstone issue. And then, and then of course, sowing the seeds of dissent within our own society, because we then get, you know, arguments internally about, oh, let's have more, you know, sort of refugees or more migration versus less. It ties us up and it certainly serves their purposes. And I think on this one, actually, it's interesting. I think, obviously, although we've left the EU, we are very much in the same boat as the EU on this. The Russians want to destabilize, destabilize all of us in this range. And we've got to actually work together to push back against the Russians and others who are looking to do the same thing. So, you know, even, even when we're outside the EU, we've got to work together with the EU countries on issues like this because they are defence issues. They are our collective defence. They're about our collective values and they're being attempted to be undermined by hostile states. Uh, yeah. Trevor, can I just ask you one last question? I haven't got much time, but uh, uh, the polls are showing that Reform UK are now within four points of the Tories. Uh, bearing in mind the shambles that uh, Rishi is presiding over, the things that we've just been discussing, uh, I mean, do you think that this uh, rise and rise of you for Reform UK, the polling, which is getting closer and closer to the Tories, could this translate into seats at the election? I think it could, but only if Nigel Farage finally throws his hat in the ring, which I suspect he might, in which case he will galvanise what is now a growing support for uh, the Reform Party. But I think on his own, Richard Tice, who's very nice, uh, won't do it by himself. He will need Farage to actually push them along to the point where they might gain a seat or two. Thank you, Trevor. I was, of course, asking that question uh, for a friend, Alex Phillips. Ah, that's all right. Timing uh, is everything, dear Trevor. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor Cavanagh. Thank you, Alan Mendoza. Thank Always a pleasure. We love those guys, yeah, great don't guys. they? They're great proper guys. chaps. Yeah. Now, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. Police are now investigating the alleged racist comments made by Tory party donor Frank Hester about Diane Abbott. We've been asking, should Rishi Sunak therefore give back his £10 million donation? Janice writes, the bloke who donated 10 million to the Conservatives said this five years ago. She puts that in capitals. <laughs> Keep the money. And what about the racist remarks Abbott always comes out with? Yeah, it doesn't even make sense logically to say you've made racist remarks, so have your money back. To yeah. me, it's just the basic common sense of that. Paul says there's thousands of hate crimes in our cities every other weekend, but I don't see the police rushing to investigate those. You want to know what I hate? Hate crimes. Uh, Lee <laughs> has written, crimes. Uh, Labour doesn't return militant union money, so why should the Tories? Hypocrisy. Uh, Richard has texted, I'm just wondering when the police are going to start doing actual police work again. Looks like never, I'm afraid, yeah, but a uh, very good point. Now, coming up after the break, Rishi Sunak is being urged to act after women's lives are ruined by the pensions age change. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. A trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, ministers are facing demands for a huge payout to WASPy women today after a watchdog found they were not told about changes to the state pension age. Millions of women born in the 1950s could be in line for compensation after the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman urged governments to do the right thing. Uh, joining us now is WASPI spokesperson Debbie Despon. Uh, you're not telling me you were born in the 1950s. <laughs> Come on! Uh, but seriously, uh, this is an extremely... Uh, oh, it's, it's a scandal, really, isn't it? 3.8 million women. Uh, we, we were talking earlier. When you come towards uh, retirement, for me, that'll be in about 20 years' time. But seriously, when you do come towards retirement, it takes a lot of planning. And so back in the 90s, when this law was ch changed, the threshold was changed, all these women preparing to retire at 60 threw them into chaos. I read about one woman who, this morning who had to sell her house. Uh, why won't they compensate you properly? Uh, it seems to me that uh, they're talking about between £1,000 and £3,000 each, which would still come to £3.5 billion quid for the taxpayer. But for you guys, not very much, really. No, a fraction of what we've lost, really. But you're right, it takes a lifetime of work to, to save and to prepare for your your retirement and for these women um, myself included who had sort of maybe 18 months notice of a, up to a six-year increase mm. just handed to them suddenly it was catastrophic because many of them had already given up work to look after um, parents or family members some had retired uh, thinking that they might only have a year to go till their retirement and they could manage on their savings mm. and then they had to live on their savings for another six years mm. so for many women it has been a, a, a disaster the compensation figure that you're talking about is um, what the ombudsman has put in his report as mm. being the level of injustice that he has he he, he thinks is appropriate for WASPI. The all-party parliamentary group, um, which also commented on stage one of that report, said that it should be level six, which would be ten thousand mm. pounds per uh, plus mm. per woman. So there's a big difference between those two sums and maybe there's some opportunity once we can talk to the government to, to find a middle path because uh, WASPy women do deserve compensation for that lack of notice. Well, this is the difficulty, isn't it? Because I think we're about to usher in a change of government at a time when I think everyone can see the national coffers are very strained. I mean, they're finding it difficult to stump up cash for the basics. Um, and so and listening this morning, actually, I remember this story as an issue back when I was an MEP about five years ago. But uh, listening this morning to the morning rounds of um, uh, the politicians, and it seems to me the Labour Party are failing to give any sort of commitment that they will give this. Uh, the Conservative Party, I assume, will run down the clock because then it won't be their issue. I mean, how hopeful are you of actually getting a government in that goes, right, we do need to deal with this? Well, we have achieved enormous cross-party support over the years for WASPI, so that we know that backbenchers support us very well. It is time now, we think, for the, for the Labour Party to 
state where their position is. They have been supportive in the past, but Emily Thornbury was uh, uh, avoiding, morning, avoiding right. the issue. Yeah, and, so. and, and it definitely is going to be the hot potato that ends up in the Labour Party's lap mm. and the Labour government's lap. And we have been encouraging uh, politicians to consider what a compensation package would look like for WASPy women, yeah. because there are you know, millions of us. First of all, uh, before I ask this question, just to remind uh, the audience what WASPy stands for. Women Against State Pension Inequality. Indeed. And uh, you, you mentioned your own story. Tell us what, how, how it affected you, this uh, sudden well, change. Well, my working life was as a carer for, for, um, for our daughter. So we made voluntary contributions so that I would, when I reached 60, have a state pension. So I wasn't able to have a career or even a regular paid um, uh, working life. Um, and so suddenly finding out that I was going to be working an extra six years before I reached that point of some kind of financial independence came as a big shock to me. And it also meant that I was dependent on my husband's earnings um, for far longer than I, than I had ever imagined. Mm -hmm. But women's experiences, we're all women who are affected by the same thing, but in so many different ways. And as, as you say, women have had to sell their homes. Women's have, women have had their divorce settlements agreed on the basis that they would retire at 60. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, women have been using food banks. They've spent their savings. They had planned. They did know what was going to what, what was coming down the track for them. They knew when they started work they were going to retire at sixty. Mm. Many of them had never been able to pay into a company pension scheme because women were prevented from joining. Right. Mm. It's um, shocking, isn't it? And very quickly, uh, I kept getting it wrong. I kept saying it was Labour, but apparently it was John Major's government that uh, did this. Uh, it, like, just like a bolt from the blue, was it? It was a bolt from the blue. And, and, and the, 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 the very sad thing is that the government did its own research and knew that the women who most needed to know simply didn't know, and they chose to do nothing about it. So it really is time for them to put that historic injustice right. I mean, it would be a bit of a burden on the taxpayer, but uh, as I said earlier, uh, you know, even £10,000 doesn't seem that much for the ordeal no, you it, all went through. It, yes, it doesn't compensate for the loss of the state pension, but it would go some way to compensate for the maladministration. And the government have saved £1.81 billion increasing women's state pension. <sighs> Wow. Dear Annie. Dear Annie. Well, Debbie, thank you ever so much. I mean, keep up the good work, keep fighting the good fight, and I wish you the best of luck absolutely. with whoever's in number 10 yeah. after the next election. And actually, yeah, pin them down, make them tell you what they're going to do. Don't let them Give get my, away with the evasion. Give them a hard time, Debbie. Uh, best of luck. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, the Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron, has criticised Israel for arbitrarily denying UK aid to Gaza as the region faces the threat of imminent famine. Uh, Cameron told the Foreign Affairs Select Committee that it was an enormous frustration that aid had been routinely held up waiting for Israeli permissions. Well, it comes as Antony Blinken meets with Israeli leaders today as the US grows more critical of Israel's military campaign. And within the last hour, Russia and China have vetoed a US draft resolution that tied an immediate ceasefire in Gaza to the release of hostages held by Hamas. Uh, we've got uh, director at the Israel Solidarity Movement, Keith Fraser, with us now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Keith. Uh, uh, what do you make of this, uh, David Cameron, sort of uh, making British uh, foreign policy here, suddenly saying that unless Israel does exactly what he wants, uh, Britain will stop cease selling weapons to our ally, Israel, and if, unless my memory fails me, uh, isn't, uh, isn't our position as a nation that we stand with Israel? What's going on here? Well, first of all, there's no question that the UK needs to stand with Israel. Israel is a Western democracy, the only one in a region of tyranny, and there's no question that, that the UK should stand side by side with Israel as it tries to defeat this radical Islamic enemy that actually wants to wreak havoc on all of us, whether you're Jewish, Christian, Hindu, or what have you. So, you know, I, I would also add that in actual fact, what David Cameron forgets is the third biggest uh, seller of arms in the world is Israel. So um, the third biggest exporter of arms is Israel. And let's, let's get it right. Israel is well known, the IDF is well known to, to do joint exercises with the British, 
in counterterrorism exercises, etc. There's a huge amount of cooperation between the two countries. I think he's just paying lip service to the Islamist threat, in my opinion. Do you know, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm glad you pointed out about uh, Israel's contribution to the weapons industry, because having lived under that perpetual threat since their existence, they're world leaders in creating things like the Iron Dome. They're world leaders when it comes to cyber intelligence. And we have benefit, benefited a lot from innovations when it comes to defence systems that are coming out of Israel. Why on earth, then, is David Cameron saying this? To me, I've never heard a foreign secretary, secretary talk so openly about who we sell arms to and saying to them, well, we'll stop doing that. I don't understand his motivations, especially at the time that we've just heard in the last hour. You've got Russia and China tacitly supporting Hamas, a.k.a. Iran, at, the, at UN level. You know, there's a number of different uh, uh, things to address here, Alex. I mean, look, the first things first is with regard to humanitarian aid. Hamas, none of their fighters are hungry. Let's get that out of the way. None of them. You know, there is no shortage of food trucks and aid trucks getting taken to Gaza. Israel has done, only in recent days, enormous amounts to increase the ability to inspect the aid going in. They've obviously got to be careful of what goes in so that it's not used against them in the form of weaponry. So Israel carries out enormous amount of trucks. Uh, um, they, they carry an enormous amount of inspection of trucks, something like 248 trucks only on Tuesday were inspected by Israel and transferred to Gaza. And do you know how many of those were actually distributed by the, uh, the various distribution agencies, including the UN? 126. There's no shortage of aid going in. Israel has said, bring you the aid, bring the aid, and we will allow you to distribute it. We've got to check it first, as you can understand. But the other thing, and I would say, from an independent point of view, is in actual fact, the world talks about this whole notion of collective punishment. You know, the, the United Nations has numerous occasions imposed sanctions, which is a form of collective punishment on an economy, which actually harms the individual civilians. Well, if I was the Israeli prime minister, I might say to Hamas, release the hostages now or you're not getting, getting anything coming in. How about that? Uh, well, works for me, Keith. Uh, <laughs> but uh, here's the thing, right? It what do you make of this? So what is Netanyahu doing now that he didn't always say he was going to do? He said, we will not stop until we have destroyed Hamas. And uh, all these people, these virtue signalers like Cameron and now Blinken and Biden is the worst of the lot, who somehow or other, you know, are, are pursuing this dinner party circuit policy of, oh, well, let's be, uh, you know, kumbaya and, oh, dear, everybody's dying. Now, we, of course, it's horrible to see what's happening in Palestine, but there's a mission here, isn't there? And surely the world needs to understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that what Benjamin Nasser Netanyahu uh, has pledged to do is to destroy Hamas completely. And until he has done that, he's not going to stop, is he? Well, and who, and who can blame him? You know, the world loves to, to show Bibi Netanyahu as some extreme right winger. Yeah, he's a member of the Israeli equivalent of the Conservative Party. Yes, he's got a few, a couple of uh, extreme guys in his cabinet because they've got proportional representation, which does give succour to some of the small independent parties. That's just the way the electoral system goes. As some would say that is more democratic than our system here of first past the post. But yes, what does the world want? Ceasefire now. I tell you, the only way we should have ceasefire now is, as you know, it should be surrender now. If Hamas surrendered, gave up the hostages, gave up its weapons, put his hands up in the air, End of story. And that is the point of view. And while there's another six battalions, Hamas battalions, in Rafa, are you telling me that we should have a ceasefire only for the to be broken within a year's time when Hamas try and commit more atrocities? Netanyahu's got it right, and we should support him. Oh, Keith, brilliantly said. Fantastic to have you on the show today. Keith Fraser, Director Thanks, of Israel Keith. Solidarity Movement. You know, I just want to say about Lord Spadeface of Sheep <laughs> I know Norton. you do. No, I, cannot get, I cannot get over how we've got to this stage. He is 
unelected. He's not an MP. He's not accountable. He can't even answer a question in the House of Commons. And that man needs to answer to what work he was doing between the Shepherd's Hut and now. What were you doing with the Chinese government, Mr Cameron? Yeah, well, what were you doing? Uh, I think it's I utterly think you're quite important right to that question that is our Foreign Secretary. And nobody is asking him what he got up to in those intervening years, who he was taking money from. And he's not even able to answer questions from the Green Benches. It is disgusting. I want to know why he is not standing with Israel. He seems to be supporting Hamas at the moment, which is rather strange. Uh, so is Biden. So uh, I thought we stood with Israel. Nobody wants to see the destruction and the horror of what's happening in Gaza. But until Hamas uh, are beaten and until they give up the uh, hostages, until they surrender, who the hell are we to tell them to stop? So there you go. Anyway, uh, we've been talking about uh, Frank Hester, uh, the Tory donor who is now being investigated by the police for saying hurty, nasty words. We have more of your texts coming in on that this lunchtime now. Uh, here we go. Here's Aidan. He says uh, there should be no donors, nor should MPs be able to have other jobs. Uh, eh? <laughs> Catherine writes, how about they spend time trying to stop grooming gangs or violence rather than crying over words. I agree with that. But by the way, parties do need donors. They uh, do need donors. They, they can't exist otherwise. I do agree that otherwise. MPs shouldn't have second yeah, jobs. But that's, but that's another issue. Yeah. Now, Collins tweeted, since when do the police investigate comments? Well, since a long time, unfortunately. Yeah. And Richard says, 10 million quid doesn't distinguish between race or gender. Money is money. That's... Well, 15 million given back to uh, Hester could, well, uh, I'd say be a drain on their electoral coffers quite substantially. Yeah. Now, coming up after the break, Nike stands firm on England's football shirt design amidst criticism, even from the Prime Minister. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Nike has come under pressure to change their flag design on the recently released England football kit. The controversial logo uses navy, light blue and purple instead of, well, red and white on the St George's flag. But fans are outraged and an online petition demanding the reinstatement of the original flag has now collected thousands of signatures. Today, even the Prime Minister waded in saying we shouldn't mess with national flags. Obviously, I prefer the original and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. Uh, joining us now, uh, very pleased to welcome to the studio Deputy Head of Sport at The Sun, Dean Scoggins. Uh, it's Nike, by the way, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, <laughs> I always call it Nike. It's Alexandra, uh, So I had this idea, right? Uh, they playfully uh, updated our St George's flag. Nobody asked them to do this. Uh, I've always said uh, that's an American flag. They haven't got the guts to playfully update the Stars and Stripes, have they? And uh, next week, we're going to playfully update their Nike tick, see how they like like it. What are they doing? Uh, why did they do this? I don't believe this story that it matches the 1966 training kit. Why on earth have they done this, Dean? I, I don't understand it really, to be honest. And uh, playfully updating, the only people playing should be the players, mm. not the kit designers redesigning flags. Um, you know, the, the English kit, um, the, the kits that we've had in the history um, of the game, as you say, go right back to 66, are the nicest and most simple when they are that. Yeah, yeah. White, red, yeah. three lines on the shirt. And if we needed a St George's Cross on the collar, then let's have a How St about George's Cross. The St George's on, Cross, on the yeah. Um, it's very bizarre. It's not the first time that Nike's um, found itself in controversy in the last six months or so. You go back to the Mary Earps goalkeeper shirt, where they didn't produce the women's goalkeeper shirt because they didn't think they'd sell any for the women's goalkeeper. <laughs> um, they were then quickly forced into a U-turn there. So um, they're under a bit of pressure here now as well. But, I mean, this is also potentially just a great opportunity for Nike to uh, just make a whole new range of shirts and then people get the current ones with the sort of woke flag at a discount price and they get to make a whole load more and uh, make even more money. I'd like to think that not many will buy the uh, the one with the new flag on it and people will vote with their feet. Um, and, you know, if they do recall the shirt and then um, put the actual flag on there, then then all the better. Um, we've actually just seen in the last hour or so one of the England under-21 players, Harvey Elliott, um, has had his collar turned up during the uh, under-21 match. Now, I'm not saying he's covering the flag up on purpose on the new kit, but he has covered the flag up. Oh. Um, so, yeah, already. And tomorrow night we should be talking about England v Brazil. Harvey, um, I like, I like the yeah. son of Harvey Elliott, former Fulham player, of course. Uh, well done, Harvey. Uh, but seriously, do you think that the FA will see sense here and actually go back to the proper flag? I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised about this outcry, but it, it is bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people are absolutely furious with this, and I understand that uh, fury entirely. Do you think the FA will see sense uh, and uh, go back to the proper flag? Well, the, the statement from, from the FA here is this is not the first time that a different coloured St George's Cross-inspired design oh, has been on. used. We understand what it means to the fans, and it will be displayed proudly at Wembley tomorrow, and it will be proudly displayed at Wembley tomorrow by fans holding flags in the ground. Um, look, the, the previous incarnations of changes to the St George's Cross have been a red cross on the sleeves in 2002. Um, there were some St George's Crosses in different blue on the back um, in, to, in, to, in 98 and 2000, I think it was. Yeah. But they're not redesigning the flag. And yeah, this, no, is, exactly. this is what this is done. Uh, our colleague uh, Simon Jordan on TalkSport yesterday, I think, uh, put it perfectly. Uh, let's uh, remind ourselves of what the always erudite Mr Jordan had to say. I don't understand why we need a playful interpretation of our national flag. I don't want to get into the hysteria and hyperbole that some other people are talking about, but I don't quite understand what we're trying to achieve here. It's part of our national identity. The problem with this country at times is the policy of appeasement and no central values, and that's why we have so many of the challenges we have in societal issues. And the reality is we have a national identity, and part of that is the flag of St George's. It's not me getting carried away and being offended on behalf of it, but the bottom line is, are we? is it a joke? Is our national identity a joke? Is it something that we're ashamed of? Well, I couldn't have put it better myself. Uh, in fact, I can rarely put things better than Mr Jordan. Uh, the FA have just released a statement uh, defending this. Uh, why, why 
are they being so stubborn about it? Nobody wants it. I, I think that there will probably be a little bit of um, embarrassment that the conversation that this could be the reaction hasn't happened or didn't happen before the kit was released. Yeah. How has somebody sat there in the design process and in the approval process not said, this is not great? This is going to cause a bit of a reaction. Mm. And, you know, as Simon so well put there, but it's not broke. Don't fix it. Exactly. We didn't need to change well, that. Yeah, what I don't understand is the minute you change the colours of a flag, it's no longer the national flag. Absolutely. You know, if you start messing about with the colours of the, uh, I don't know, the Irish flag, it becomes the French flag if you change the colours. Right, I mean, right. that is the flag. And the reference to 66 and the, and the, the, the colours of 66, kit, the what? training kit, wouldn't it have been just beautiful if it had just been the training kit that had yeah. been the same as 66 right, with yeah. the jackets and stuff? And leave the, but if you look at the training, shirt, if you look at the training kit from '66, it doesn't really stack up that it's based on that. There's Alf Ramsey wearing it. That's not the same. So I mean, they're not even telling the truth. And the, the trim on the new kit is is meant to be a nod to that. And I think that um, oh, yeah. I think some someone someone in a design studio somewhere has got a little bit carried away, and someone else has not been brave enough to say no. The flag doesn't change. Can I ask you a really stupid question? Yeah. No, it's character, because I don't... I characteristically. Don't, I don't... <laughs> Watch yourself. Uh, no, but I don't care about football. I have no idea what goes on in the world of football. All I know is there's someone who looks like an albino meatloaf who scores loads of goals, can't remember his name. So why are we playing Brazil? Do you mean Harry Kane? Brazil. No, not, that's not the albino meatloaf. Who's the albino meatloaf one? I, I wouldn't... Is that wouldn't like Wayne, long Wayne, hair, Wayne, oh. really pasty oh, uh, long Oh, Erland hair. Hager. Oh, oh, Holland. That's yeah. him, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're playing Brazil because it's warm-up to the Euros and we've actually got two but fantastic Brazil's opponents. No, but um, we want to play the highest quality of opponent before the Euro. Oh, so we play Brazil right. and then Belgium, which warms us up nicely for the I tournament. See. So hopefully we're talking about football this week and not And sure. Belgium won it last time, man, didn't they? Uh, no, they didn't. Oh. <laughs> they did at some point when I was living in Belgium, they won something or got close just to winning for, something. Just before you go, I mean, Gareth, everybody goes, oh, Gareth Southgate, isn't he amazing? Uh, actually, the sum total of trophies he's won... England is zero. Uh, can he uh, stop the rot this time, do you think? Well, this time, I've said this a lot in the last couple of weeks, this time we're the favourites. Yeah. We are the best team, player for player, in the tournament. So this time, for the first time in my lifetime, if we don't win it, it will be fine. Yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's got the pressure on this time. Absolutely. So, uh, well done. All the best to England. And wear the St George's Cross, eh? Thank you very much to Dean Scoggins of the Sun. Excellent. Uh, sadly, though, Alex, we've come to the end of this show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us next week on Monday, 9.30 a.m. Up next, there is Peter Cardwell standing in for Ian Collins. Have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful weekend. See you Monday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you better. laughs>